Boom, what's up everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Saki, and we are still on site at AAA, the American Anthropological Association's annual meeting. Very excited to now be sitting down with Dr. Duncan Earl. Thanks for coming on to the show. Thank you for having me. Really appreciate it. Really looking forward to our conversation. Good. Let's give a background on Duncan. He's a professor and coordinator in global studies at Marymount California University for the last eight years. He's focused on global development, rural community livelihoods, resilient culture and sustainability. Prior to that, eight years associate professor at University of Texas El Paso, three years associate professor at Clark University, and also associate professor at Vanderbilt, Texas A&M, and Dartmouth. So it's been 35 years of professing and teaching. Wow. PhD in anthropology from State University of New York at Albany. He's an author. He also has had 50 plus publications. Uh, the book is called Uprising of Hope, accompanying the Zapatistas on their journey of sustainable development. And he's also works as an editor for the Library of Congress and an editor for Middle America Ethnography and co-editor of the University of Texas Press Border Series. And he is Students are currently involved in applied sustainability research with the Port of Los Angeles, as well as with a global carbon offset initiative, Jadura, to support large-scale rainforest preservation and sustainable community development in the Congo Basin. Really excited to talk about that carbon offset program. That's gonna be really exciting. <coughs> and yeah, that's crazy. It's 47 million hectares um, that are the, some of the largest rainforests in the world that you're working. I'm, I'm really excited to talk about that. Mm -hmm. I'm super excited to talk about just, you know, 35 years of research and professing. And yeah, let's let's jump into it. But I but even before we get into what's going on now, Duncan, let's hear about you as a kid. OK, how the heck did you get involved in anthropology? Well, I did have a leg up in that uh, I was a, a large family that was raised in the countryside in upstate New York, right next to the, the Onondaga Indian Reservation. So I went to high school uh, with about a third of our school was Haudenosaunee, as they call themselves, part of the Iroquois Six Nations. A third of your school growing up was a, a Native American tribe? Yes. Yeah. Whoa. Yeah. So we had the best lacrosse team in upstate New York. Needless to say, and we were very integrated. And it wasn't uh, it wasn't a segregated situation because yeah. they were an integral part of our community, our rural community. And my father, who was a professor of landscape architecture at Syracuse University, he uh, had been a kind of a bum artist in the '30s in Mexico, and it was uh, got it was part of the muralist tradition of Diego Rivera and Cisneros and them and actually worked as an assistant to Rivera for some time when he was painting the, the opera house in Mexico City. So as a child we were regaled with stories about Mexico and my father is a, was also a painter so we had all these landscapes of other places. And then uh, at a fairly early age during the summers he started driving there and camping in Mexico with his whole family of seven kids. That's a big family. <coughs> yes. Whoa. In fact, in 1957, when I was five, we drove in a Volkswagen van all the way to Costa Rica. Whoa. And so every summer he did this, justifying it essentially as, as uh, visual material for his classwork. He dragged us all through, uh, my gosh, by the time I was a junior or sophomore in high school, I'd probably been to 60 countries in four continents, mostly camping. That's a lot of culture exposure at a young age. At a age. young age. That's great. And then I went back to my little home, you know, insular little, little hometown with half Indians and half rural uh, farming, farmers. Um, and then when I was a junior in high school, my parents sent me on an exchange program and I lived a year in Barcelona where I learned to speak Spanish and really learned to have an appreciation for my hometown in a way I previously hadn't because by the time a year of living in cosmopolitan Europe, you come back to this little town and you go, wow, this is like a, like a novel about you know, uh, the last picture show. You know? So uh, it gave me a very kind of cosmopolitan preparation for school 
Then I went into uh, SUNY Binghamton, which was close by my home. I went close by rather than some of the other uh, schools I'd been accepted in because my mother had recently passed on and kind of was part-time taking care of my family as well. And then uh, when my father remarried, I uh, ended up involved in a summer field school that took me to um, Guatemala to do archaeology in Guatemala. And while I had traveled some, uh, again, in the Mediterranean, I spent a semester in Malta and a, a semester back in Spain, the summer Guatemalan experience was new for me because unlike, say, Egypt or other places where the contemporary people are very different from the ancient people, in Highland Guatemala, the Maya that were employed as workers on our archaeological site that I was an undergraduate grunt for, but which I had, I had an advantage over the others because I spoke good Spanish. I could see the workers talking with each other about artifacts, and in many cases their interpretations seemed to be better than our archaeologist who was leading the dig. So I kind of left my romantic notion of exploring the mysterious ancient Maya and said, wait a minute, if I want to understand the people of ancient times, I'm not going to be able to dig up ideas or conversations. But I can learn the ideas and have the conversations with the ones who are alive now. Mm -hmm. And maybe that will illuminate more the past. While I was transitioning from archaeology to studying the present, Guatemala had a serious earthquake, 1976. And suddenly, thousands of people were there without ho housing. Thousands more had broken homes, you know, broken up houses, and or were in, in fear of having more houses fall. 35,000 people died. And I suddenly started to sort of shift a little more towards well, I want to learn from them about these esoteric cultural ideas, but I also really feel like, coming from a privileged place in the North, that I should be helping. So I suspended, or so I thought, my uh, graduate research to work for Save the Children in a project that they had in Guatemala in nine municipalities, 103 communities. And we were doing things like reforestation, community organizing, helping people improve their, uh, their housing so they wouldn't fall down in an earthquake. And at the same time, I got invited by the local Mayas to live with them, not with the gringos, not with the expatriate uh, uh, group that I was working with. And uh, I was a single guy. Uh, I was willing to live in somewhat less fancy environment to live with the local people since we were trying to help them. Mm -hmm. I began learning their language, eating with them, going to the markets with them. And little by little, I began to realize from that why the aid programs were not working very well. Mm. And it was largely because no one was really asking the local people. Uh, wha uh, we were focusing on housing, for example. No one really asked the question, what does a house mean? We know what the physical object of a house is, and that's what we were all focused on. But Mayan houses are not American houses. Mm -hmm. They have distinctly different meanings. Mm -hmm. They're temples for uh, the family, especially mm -hmm. if the father is a shaman and the mother's a midwife, as mm -hmm. in the case of the household mm -hmm. I was living in. Mm -hmm. There are also granaries, places where people store their corn and they point out that corn needs more babying than people. Mm. You know, he said, oh, well, one woman said to me, oh, my husband, he can go sleep in the cornfield if he's been out at the party and doesn't make it home. And I just go out and da at dawn and put his hat on his head so his, head, his brains don't fry in the sun. But corn has to be taken care of. So we were completely misoriented because we were thinking of houses as we think of them as places to store our stuff in our crash pad. Mm -hmm. 
Whereas they were thinking of them more as a religious place and a place to store next year's seed mm. corn. Mm. And uh, women uh, administratively kind of owned the house and the men owned the field. So when we were giving courses to men about improving the, how to build a house, we didn't realize we were teaching the wrong people. Mm -hmm. Because since men owned houses, we figured those were the people who would make the decisions about houses. This was not the case. Men decide about corn, women decide about houses. And in the Mayan language there, Kiche Maya, the name for your wife is Rahauha, which is your house owner. Mm -hmm. Which had we known this at mm -hmm. the start, yeah. would have perhaps reoriented, reoriented us. But because these aid programs sort of commit to a plan before they really know much about what they're going to do because they never have money for prior research because who wants to donate to prior research to help, right? How so old were you here again? Early 20s, early 23. 20s. So, you're in, so you're in your early 20s and you're starting to really discover that there are these societal differences among cultures yes. and that really we kind of, we kind of we put we push some of our cultures on other people and just assume yes. that they have our cultures, yes. whereas their cultures completely different in w the way you just yes. described the difference in a, a temple <coughs> versus a crash pad, um, a yes. place for next year's seed. Um, that is so interesting. And then and then you also bring up this interesting point about with humanitarian efforts across the world, it's really important to uh, go there, understand the culture. Uh, really get the nuance of the culture to know how to most have the highest efficacy right. of distributing resources to that place. Yes. And many non-governmental organizations use the excuse of we're in a hurry or donors don't donate for prior research to not do this. Mm. And this is why so often they fail. Mm. And I watch this fail and the more I told them about this, how this was not working, the more they marginalized me. Mm. Right? It's because this was a threat to, mm -hmm. to their livelihoods and their operations. And eventually I quit and uh, went on to live uh, some longer time with this Mayan family. And I, I actually was sort of an apprentice to a shaman. Nice. And really learned, although I didn't write my dissertation about shamanism or any of the, you know, Carlos Castanedian mm -hmm. characteristics of things, I used what I had learned as a, a bottom rung trained shaman to understand why community development was not working. In other words, I learned from the most, what we might call the most esoteric dimensions of their culture to see why the most concrete efforts to improve their lives materially, we were approaching them completely wrong. Well, there's a an, an whole different Set, sense essence of being when you're a shaman in Central America or South America yes. than when you are a householder in the United States. Yes. Completely different. Completely essence. different. For example, we built model houses to show them how to build a house that wouldn't fall down in an earthquake because most of their houses were adobe. And these were model houses we tested on a flatbed with pneumatic pumps underneath that recreated an earthquake. I mean, it was technically cutting edge appropriate tech, as they called it at the time. But what we didn't take uh, I I note of at the time, and I learned through my um, time living with the people, was that you don't build a house that anyone would ever live in that is at a crossroads, which is exactly where we put our model so everyone could see it. Because ro crossroads are where the spooks hang out at night, just like they did in the Old South for African Americans. And I don't know if you saw, oh brother, we're out there. That's how he learned how to, he met the devil at the crossroads, right? So this belief, which is a common one uh, about where you don't want to hang out at night, there we put this model house. And on top of that, Mayas view their houses as temples, as they say. So they have to follow, they have to face and follow the direction of the sun. They have to have their back to the east 
and they're faced the door and porch to the west. To the west, as it sets, you yes, want to have the sunlight come in. Which the in the rainy season, since it usually ends at about four in the afternoon anyway, you can sit on your porch and dry out, but only if it's facing the west. Mm -hmm. So there were practical dimensions and spiritual dimensions yeah. that match. Yeah. Well, they made the model house facing the east, yeah, yeah. which is the direction of death or the sun in the underworld when mm -hmm. it's coming back. So. Uh, I began observing that people would walk by our model house and cross themselves, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so I took my old uh, compadre up there and I said, Don Lucas, um, what do you think of our model house? He says, oh, very beautiful, very beautiful. For gringos. Yeah, for gringos. <clears throat> and I said, uh, well, uh, would you like to live in a house like this? Oh, no, not while I'm alive. And he said, we have one house like this, and it's in the graveyard. It's where we pray for the dead. <laughs> so if you wanted a model house for us to pray for dead people, this would be a great model. But to live in. Plus, he never asked a shaman for permission. It only cost, you know, 10 cents and a chicken to do the ceremony of permission to put the house there in the first place. And so the, the owner of the earth is really going to be upset with his house because we didn't ask for permission and it's like a boil on his skin. Did you end <laughs> up... Et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> did, did you end up having deeply profound spiritual experiences with the shaman and... Oh, yeah. Yeah, so can you, can we, can we go run through some of those? Okay. Uh, one of the most uh, amazing was there, there is a system of caves underneath a nearby um, archaeological site. In fact, my article in this book is about this cave because usually in Mesoamerica, ancient Mesoamerica, they made archaeological sites on top of places with caves, mm. like Teotihuacan. Mm -hmm. The main pyramid has a cave underneath it. But in the highlands of Guatemala, there aren't much in the way of caves because it's all volcanic deposition for a thousand meters down. So what they did, and this is about 200 years before the uh, arrival of the Spaniards, they built a cave. And what's better about a built cave than a natural cave is they tell you exactly what they want a cave to be because they've built it themselves. And this is still used as a sacred site by the shamans today. Right, it's an archaeological site of 700 years of age that they're using right now as a sacred site. And so uh, we periodically in the right day of the Mayan calendar would go and do offerings in this cave. And one time when we went there were a few tourists around who ended up going with us into the cave. They wanted to see how it's, you know. And my teacher didn't mind showing a few uh, extranjeros, foreigners, about um, shamanic culture and I was able to translate and explain things so while we're in there what are you it, offering uh, we're offering incense copal incense okay. which is from a, a special aromatic tree the oldest incense in the New World um, also um, the resin of pine trees that are tapped a certain kind of pine tree cool. and uh, candles and flowers okay because the 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 uh, concept, their concept is that we are in one world and there's another parallel world. Mm. And in that parallel world are the dead, the unborn, mm. and the great heroes of history, mm. and other kind of powerful entities mm -hmm. that shamans are able to mm -hmm. connect with, contact, and sometimes employ. What's beyond the three-dimensional perception that we have yeah. in this world. Yeah, it's sort of like this other world right here you know we have this idea that when the dead die they may go to heaven hell or to fertilizer but they're out of here mm. they're somewhere else mm. the Mayan concept of the dead in Mesoamerica generally is the dead are right here mm -hmm. they're just in another dimension that mm -hmm. unless we're shamans we don't see them mm -hmm. so and they don't eat like we eat what they like is light aromas mm. prayer good feeling mm -hmm. 
which interestingly enough this is a muscle it's like when you go and shoot a basketball or you're an author or whatever you're practicing the more you practice it the better you get at it so the yes. more that you practice the ritual of connecting to uh, the dead um, to go through right. this process the better you'll get at it and the more you'll be able to right. effectively communicate right. with what's going on in that area and amongst the Maya the communicator, the connector between shamans and this other world are a little dwarf-like spirit called um, sakikoshol, means white sparker, or uh, like flint spark. Mm -hmm. He's the flint spark guy. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, he looks like a child. He's dressed in a little white, a red, red or white uniform, a little hat. And he has a little axe that's his sparker. He's danced in one of their um, ritual dances. They, they reenact him. And he's, uh, so any shaman has this little duende, this little spirit who connects him to this other world. It's also represented in his medicine bundle. So we're in this cave and, and with our uh, medicine bundles and our offerings of flowers and candles and incense. and. And what are the medicine bundles? Well, th those are the, the, the um, when you're initiated as a Mayan shaman, you get a, um, a, a series of 200 seeds, um, erythrina, what we call the mezcal, mezcal. seed. Uh -huh. they're, they look like black beans, but they're bright red, uh -huh. and they're poisonous. Uh -huh. So they never fall apart or degrade. And, th and with that, crystals and other things that you find during your initiation. Mm. In other words, it's like um, the, the, all of these seeds and crystals and so on are used to count out the days of the mind calendar. So it's your counting bag in a way. Mm. Uh, because and is there plant medicine used as well? Oh yeah. yeah. There's herbal medicines and there's non-ordinary medicines. And then which um, plant medicines are used uh, Mexican marigold or uh, Tagetes lucida, uh, they call pericon. Uh -huh. It's a natural aspirin, but it works slower, but it's more gentle on the uh -huh. stomach. Whoa. Uh, and 200 other plants, uh, but I'm just doing yeah. that one because it's yeah. where I, that's the first medical plant I learned. It saved my life Whoa. when I was, got very sick there. Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, and the midwives know about those plants. The shamans tend to work in the non-ordinary world. And then the midwives or people who deal with bone setting, they do all of the physical healing. Because the idea amongst the Maya is when you get ill, you need to have physical treatment, you have, need spiritual treatment, you need sociological treatment, who have you been fighting with? Yeah. <clears throat> and you need sort of psychoanalytic treatment. That Illness is a total illness, a total and healing illness. is yes. a total process. This is not just a physical thing. This right. is who are you talking to? What yes. kind of a cultural setting are you right. actually? Did doing? you have an argument with someone? Yeah, yeah. You know, are, are you and your cousin fighting about land inheritance after Uncle Uncle Jose died? Because that's going to cause lots of <coughs> stress. Yeah. So, um, is this a majority of the kind of like the twenties for you? Is this study and then did you also end up taking this into the next couple of decades? Oh, oh yeah, in fact, uh, I, I still do divinations. Yeah. I, mean, I, I ended up having to do a divination for a Hopi woman because her husband was a Navajo and they didn't trust either the Navajos or the Hopis to do spiritual healing. Whoa. Because they're in conflict. So and they brought me in as an outsider to do the healing process. And then is this a lot of what you've been teaching the last? No. no. No, no. I don't talk about this in the classroom at all. Interesting. Or in my publications. Interesting. Because, why? Because the Mayas explained to you very clearly, you didn't earn this. You know, all my publications I earned through re hard research and so on. But I didn't earn my divining talent. I was born with it, according to them. Huh. And they knew about it through divining that I needed to learn this. In uh -huh. fact, I needed to learn this if they were going to throw me out of the community. Yeah, yeah. Because I'd be a spiritual loose cannon and I yeah. might do something. Yes. I might whammy somebody without knowing it. Yes. Something like that. Yeah. So it's been part of my personal life. It has guided my anthropological life. But I don't write about it. Interesting. I mean, I talk about it 
in an, in an interview like this because it so much has influenced other things of mine. Exactly. But it's really become a part of me, not really part of my research. I've written a couple of very sure, humanistic sure. articles, like about when we went to the first um, uh, uh, higher shaman than my teacher, who, because I wanted a second opinion because I didn't think a gringo should be learning this stuff. And they took me to a possession shaman. They're truly scary folks. Whoa. But uh, back to the cave. We're in the cave. There are these other witnesses, and uh, tourists from Germany and, and France and the US, six or seven of them. And then while we're doing our ceremony, we start hearing laughing children, the voices of laughing children. And all of us heard this, not just me or just the Mayan shaman. And his couple of his kids were with us too. And we're going like, there's some little kids coming into the other end of this 200 meter long cave. And we hear them getting closer and closer. And then when they're just about to come around the corner where we could see them, silence. And my uh, old Mayan compadre turns around to me and says, compadre Duncan. Those are my striker spirits. Those are my sakikoshot. They come to, to uh, connect me, you know, to sort of to connect, like tele telephone to the other side, right? Or the telegraph to the other side. And we're all going, yeah, no, it was probably a school group that came in, you know, and then turned around before they got this far. They saw the smoke and decided to leave. And so, the tourists fanned out over that whole site trying to find young people. There was nobody there. We asked the guy who takes tickets at the entrance. No school group, no children have come here anywhere. And we were all left with, you know, dee 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 dee. Mm. <laughs> who were those voices? We all heard those voices. Those were the kids that help the shaman connect to yes. the other side. They're like little miniature people that fly around and help the shamans do mm. their stuff. And they're the ones that give the knowledge to you when you're divining. Because divination is not like about what you know, it's about how empty you can become. It's how much you're not there so that the non-ordinary guides your hand. Interesting, so <clears throat> if you can get past the ego that's so in control of this mm -hmm. of this body right and if you can kind of treat yourself more like a channel yes. to receive yes then you can really tune into what right. is coming through so i appropriated the shamanic vehicle to understand my world mayan world especially better but not as a vehicle for tenure and promotion not as a vehicle for writing up articles that would get me a better job in my discipline. That seemed wrong to me, ethically. I feel I, as though even though you became more spiritual and very understanding of a lot of the shamanistic practices, I'm one of the, I feel strongly about the integration of spirituality and mysticism with science mm -hmm. and individualism and collectivism. And so if we were to I'm be there. able to strongly merge those, because <coughs> that's why I asked you if you were passing along some of that to your students. And so shall we, should we venture into some of the, some of the dissertation? How'd you get from there to All the right. dissertation? So yeah. I write my dissertation essentially on why community development without prior depth research is a waste of time and money. That was essentially my dissertation. But I thought I was going to only do it on Highland Guatemala. But in the middle of that comes the political repression of the late 70s. And I find myself having to flee Guatemala. Jeez. Not only is my life endangered, and this is during, as soon as Ronald Reagan got into office here, the repression started happening there. And when was the earthquake? 76 was the earthquake. 76, and 70, 35,000 people died. died. But by 79, they were starting to kill way more people than died in the earthquake. Because of the... For political reasons. They were looking at El Salvador. Mm -hmm. They looked at the victory in Nicaragua. 
Ronald Reagan was giving them the okay sign that we weren't going to worry about human rights anymore, as we had under Jimmy Carter. And so uh, they began c killing large numbers of, of Native people in what they called a preventive counterinsurgency. Mm. Anyone who'd been involved in cooperatives or with the Catholic Church or anything that in any way was seen as progressive, including development programs like our own, were being targeted. In the end, they ended up in about two and a half, three years killing something in the neighborhood of 200,000 Indians. Whoa. Mostly by hand, with machetes. Jeez. Uh, some they burned in churches. They put everybody in the church and set it on fire. They did horrible things. They sk I lost about 100 of my friends. Some of them were skinned alive. So I suddenly, in the midst of my spiritual situation, got a real political slap in the face and had to flee because seeing a, a, a North American talking to an Indian could le lead to an Indian die, to a Maya die. So and I it was one more time, it was a fight in the late 70s. It was a count because they wanted to prevent an insurgency. Yeah, there were some rebels in the northern part of Guatemala uh -huh. who were saying, we're going to overthrow the Guatemalan government yeah. and we're going to get the Indians to help us do it. Oh. And the Indians didn't know anything about it, really, most of them. And there was a few who joined the rebels, but not many. And so the rest of them were all caught in the middle. And I had to get the heck out of there. I, I, I remember selling my typewriter and my camping gear and everything I could to give yeah. bus tickets to the yeah. community leaders to leave the country. I mean, and, and I, I got the last, you know, took the last ticket and went on the last bus out uh, and got to this place in, in Mexico called the state of Chiapas, which at that time was a very quiet, calm, backward part of Mexico. And I came across, while I was there, through a third party, uh, a guy named Gary Gosen, who was a professor from, previously from Harvard, who was teaching at Santa Cruz, who was doing a research project in Chiapas. And I didn't really, wasn't ready to go home, and he had a fascinating project of looking at uh, Highland Mayas from that side of the border, who had gone down to the rainforest and colonized it. Huh. And here was a case a counterpoint to Guatemala of people who were doing their own development. So it wasn't development imposed by outsiders who didn't know what they were doing. Mm -hmm. Culturally, it was local people who were the culture that was doing it. Mm -hmm. So my dissertation contrasted how people, when they do their own development, do it with what happens when it's imposed from the outside. And that mm -hmm. was yeah. a, a pretty passable 500-page dissertation. And that's great because you had an exact contrasting dichotomy yes. between when it is <coughs> when you when you think you know what you're doing and when you actually know right. what you're doing, and the difference right. between um, humanitarian work in that sense. And it was very good that I was in a new cultural landscape because the last thing I wanted people to know that I, was that I was trained as a Mayan shaman, because there are all sorts of different positions on that, even amongst the indigenous people. Right, never mind the mestizos and the government. So, because some are evangelical Protestants, some are Reformed Catholics, some think that the traditions are brujeria or witchcraft. So it was much better for me to sort of keep that, unless I came across a, a, a shaman there, and they always knew. But other than that, and they always kept it secret because they understood. But it gave me great perspective uh, to look at this pioneer uh, group of people who were mostly evangelical, Indian evangelicals. They were not following the old ways. And uh, looking at how they had created for themselves a little paradise because they know how to develop themselves given the opportunity and the resources. And the Mexicans have this idea of agrarian reform that doesn't exist in Guatemala, where if you can pioneer some new un cultivated land, after a few years of doing it, they'll give you title to it. And it's a collective title, mm -hmm. not an individual title. So this was all fascinating, and Mexico is a, 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 an interesting, contrasting place to see a related group of Mayas. I had to learn a new Mayan language, but it was way easier than the first one, because they're closely related, like, mm -hmm. say, Italian and Spanish. Mm -hmm. 
And then the Zapatista uprising happens. Mm -hmm. uh, but meantime, uh, I had written my dissertation. I'd gotten a job at Dartmouth, and I had moved from Dartmouth to Vanderbilt. And then on to a a Texas A&M, where I had also become interested in community development, which had always been a theme for me, on the U.S.-Mexico border. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I liked the I issue. I had been on the Mexico-Guatemala border, and looking at border issues there, now is on the U.S.-Mexico border, and contrasting it. And I really look, like to look at what we might call controlled comparison con contrasts, where some things are the same and some things are not the same, rather than all different. So I spent some time doing work with these poor col uh, colonias. We even, uh, out of Texas A&M, built community centers for them, because I came to the conclusion that the real help they needed in those in those settings was some central location that they could get together. Um, but all the time while I'm doing that, I'm also going back to Chiapas and checking up on the, what's going on with the Zapatistas because I knew before there was the uprising, I knew these people, both those that supported the uprising and those who opposed it. And in one of those visits, I ran across this woman, Jean Simonelli, who had previously done work with the Navajo, with the Diné, and she's a fabulous writer. Like she writes novels at the same time. And I said, Jean, how about you and I do field work on everyday life of the Zapatistas? What would it be like not talking to Subcomandante Marcos or the luminaries of the movement? You know, this was heralded as the first postmodern anti-capitalist movement that arose. But that was all focused on their leadership who had a very interesting alternative theory that wasn't left and wasn't right. It was kind of what we might imagine a, a kind of pro-peasantist position. And it arose against the North American Free Trade Agreement. Yeah. Right? And so that was all one level of it. And that's where most uh, anthropologists and political scientists and others engaged. I wasn't interested in that. That was other people's work. I wanted to go live in Zapatista and non-Zapatista communities mm -hmm. that were in the Zapatista region and find out what's the difference between living every day as a Zapatista and as a non-Zapatista Mayan peasant. And what were your findings? Well, I found that everyday life I amongst the Zapatistas, was, it was fascinating because they have, uh, they have a belief in consensus, not in majority rule. So everything that they would decide to do, everybody had to, every adult had to agree to do. And so we would sit in on meetings that would sometimes take three days to decide whether they were gonna do a coffee dryer or a bread oven. But in that process, they were learning the process of everybody being engaged in their own self-governance. Mm -hmm. You know, completely the opposite of here where governance is so distant from us. Mm -hmm. You know, and good luck with that letter to your senator. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas here, people had taken on the processes of governing at every level, at the village level, at the regional level, and at the top, based on whole levels of consensus. Mm -hmm. And they also were being very positive to their enemies. They literally loved their enemies. They would pe have people who condemn them for joining the Zapatistas, and then they come and leave them a plate of food. Mm -hmm. They, they enacted the best of liberation theology mm. on a daily basis. Love your enemy, you know, your, your, uh, turn the other cheek. Uh, we're all the same under God. Uh, and uh, <coughs> they saw in these Christian teachings, which one could say were originally foreign to them, they kind of turned them into a Mayan revolutionary document. So this was utterly fascinating to me. And uh, uh, Jean and I wrote this book, which we wrote like a uh, historic novel with dialogue, with uh, you know, uh, pa uh, character development, page turner chapters. And we even put a chapter about each one of us so that we wouldn't have the postmodern authorial voice problem because we to said exactly why we were doing this. And we wrote it in such a way that a freshman in college could read it. Mm. 
which were exactly the attitudes <coughs> that we also found that the Zapatistas wanted us to promote, that this wouldn't be some esoteric book that you need a very large anthropological vocabulary to understand, but something that anyone could read. I, fact, like, I like that, that we're all children under God, yeah. that we're all born from the cosmos, and here we are finding ourselves as stewards of Earth, and how yes. do we work together? <coughs> how do you love people that, yeah. even if they have an opinion that contradicts yours, how do you work things out through a consensus? Yeah. Yeah. And all of this showed me a model of community development mm -hmm. that they themselves had devised for themselves. For an example, one of the great problems in community development is how do you develop female leadership? Right? If women have to run the household as administrators, the reason why men amongst the Mayas are the, uh, end up being the leaders is the women don't have the time, because right? they have all these other responsibilities. So what the Zapatistas were able to do is first get the men to get more involved in taking care of things in the household. They would have these meetings only with women, leaving the men at home mm -hmm. with the kids. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they had to do it. Mm -hmm. And then second, they insisted that in Zapatista areas, they have male stores and female stores. Now these are just rural stores that sell nails and boots and barbed wire and tomatoes and baby clothes. But they decided that they should have ones for men and ones for men. And as much as the first world feminists didn't really get this, the reason was because once women had stores of their own, they developed their leadership yeah. outside of the reach of men. Yep. So they didn't have to deal with male insecurity about women developing leadership mm -hmm. because it was all women. Mm -hmm. And it turns out the women who were the heads of these stores became very often leaders. Yeah. Now, I would have never thought of that. That's very In fact, cool. it would have run counter to what we think about segregating mm -hmm. men and women. Yeah, so a segregation, <coughs> although short term. To reintegrate, to but women with more power. With more power. That's very right? interesting. It was brilliant. Yeah. And so rather than be someone trying to impose development on people as an outsider with donor money, I was now a student of their own development. So you can see how this made perfect sense for me because here I was getting a lesson and what happens when people really have the power to redesign their own society for themselves? What would they do? And they had, yes, they had help from non-governmental organizations and international solidarity and yada yada, but the way they set up their stuff was to solve the problems that they themselves perceived. And so we wrote this book on an uprising of hope because we thought, here is a, an example of, of uh, how people do it for themselves and w uh, from which we could learn great lessons. Right. What were the other great lessons that you learned about how they were building their society okay. that we could learn from? Um, that the process is, is as important as the product. How you come to a decision about something is really important because you don't want people going around saying, well I, well, I wasn't, I didn't support that, right? Because peasant societies, they're poor. They, they're very subject to divisions and conflict because they're competing with each other for you know, scarce land and scarce everything. So when you bring people together and say, we're not going to make this decision unless you, you all agree with it, it it's, to us sounds very inefficient. But that long and laborious process leads everyone to understand why anyone is making this decision. They all own it when they're done. So the time that's invested in it, the Im immense amount of time that's invested in making consensus decisions is all medicine to their social relations. Interesting, so there is a geopolitical arms race that is occurring on the planet that mm -hmm. prevents us from allocating the needed time to properly communicate with one another yes. to reach consensus yes. and that is a huge hindrance yep. for us progressing in a way that doesn't make it feel like people are being left behind yes yes and all the divisionism even within our two political sectors today 
uh, we don't have consensus within those sectors, and we certainly don't love our neighbor across them. Yeah. Right? So they're a great lesson to us. They have turned the tables on, on our political lives because they're showing even us right now a better example. And uh, not that uh, everyone is reading my book and understanding this, uh, but they haven't lowered the price of it on Amazon yet, so <laughs> somebody's still buying it. <laughs> Those are awesome <laughs> lessons from the book. Now, give give us a rundown of the okay the thirty five years of professing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, as you've done that, mm -hmm. what have been some of the profound takeaways from working with students mm -hmm. and also with some of the lessons that you've learned that you are teaching? Well, I teach a course, for example, on um, management for sustainability to business students. The last thing you think is anthropologists teaching in a business school. But um, if you really look at business, uh, the people who rise to the top have the people skills. It's not about numbers. It's about being able to interact with people. And second of all, uh, there's a huge area arising in business that if you want to get into it, doesn't have as much com competition as regular business. It's what we might call green business or sustainable business, where you're being socially and environmentally sustainable. My students get this very quickly. Now, mind you, it's a Catholic school, so they're taught to be socially responsible. Uh, and my pitch to them is, to say, imagine you could have a business which improves social life, which improves the life of the planet, and you make money. And now, don't you think that would take market share away from a business that just did what it did, but doesn't have any positive social or environmental aspects, and in fact might have negative ones? I said, so if you want to start in business and be successful and take market share away from uh, other less responsible uh, businesses, mm. this is how you might do it. So I have four projects that students are working on right now. Mm. One of them is looking at how uh, property managers could be greener and then compete better with other property management operations because they're green. Like and so putting solar panels on their roofs. And appropriate insulation so yeah. that people who go there don't have to pay such high utility bills, yep. et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's a hundred things that an average building could get better if it were greener. Awesome. <coughs> mm -hmm. So one's doing that as he's an intern in one of these property managements. Mm -hmm. And he has two other students from my class helping him by mm -hmm. researching the competition cool. and looking at how to make a building greener. Cool. The second group is doing a Craigslist for our community, our, our student community mm -hmm. and, and alumni and so on, so that the community recycles internally to itself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you build community through exchanging goods mm -hmm. within the community through a, a, a university-based Craigslist yeah. that they have actually finished in this term. Mm -hmm. The third group is looking at electric golf carts to replace cars in beach communities mm -hmm. in LA. Mm -hmm. And that's going great guns. In fact, they have too much work at this mm -hmm. point. Mm -hmm. They'll never finish it all by the end of the term. And that may be a new popular modality of transit in yeah. smaller communities. That doesn't Electric. produce greenhouse gases, yeah. that uses less energy generally, mm -hmm. and is more appropriate for the environment, that th the setting that they're in. And then the fourth one is taking the ideas that I've been using in my Congo project that we haven't talked about on carbon offsetting and applying it to Mongolia. I'd had several Mongolian students previously. I learned about their problem of that climate change has undermined the migratory patterns of their herding so that half the herders are now in a, what we call in Latin America the circle of misery around the capital city and, but they don't want to be there. They'd like to go back and raise animals in the countryside, but they don't really know how to do it anymore because climate change has messed up the patterns. So their project, and it's a project that we hope to follow through on, is to figure out how we might, through, through various technologies, map in real time where the weather patterns are operating and get 
the herders to be able to go back uh, out on the mm -hmm. land. How do we pay for that? Through carbon offsets. Mm -hmm. Basically, a lot of people don't know this, but gr traditional grasslands, like the old prairies in our, our uh, west, Midwest, the steppes of Mongolia, uh, Kazakhstan, mm -hmm. Tajikistan, mm -hmm. and the savannas of Africa, mm -hmm. which by the way are m way larger than rainforests, mm. absorb about half as much carbon when they're healthy as a rainforest, mostly in their roots. Mm -hmm. In fact, there's plenty of that going on right here in California. Um, but if they're undergrazed or overgrazed, they can end up producing carbon. Mm. So we have a financial incentive to optimize animal management in Mongolia to pay for them to do it right. That's great. And it can be done in such a way that you can have investors who make money off of this. The people who are doing it can, can uh, make a profit at it. And yet all of the people who are working on it also benefit from it. So Ooh. they're working on that project right now. And I'm hoping to go to Mongolia in June. Uh, I got $60,000 for startup to actually do a private sector project of putting vast quantities of the grasslands of Mongolia under conservation for mm -hmm. carbon offset purposes. Yes. So <laughs> then these four projects yep. are, um, they're really powerful and they're diverse and that, that's, yes. that's great. And then they share with each other what they find. Yes. And it's good to have <coughs> lots of young uh, minds working on the yep. projects and sharing, like you said, and being an inspirational piece for other young people to get involved in similar projects. Yep. So, and saving the planet and helping people. Yes, exactly. Right? Exactly. The, the, what they call the triple bottom line. Yep. People, planet, profit. Profit. Yeah. People, planet, profit. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, yeah, because planet or profit without people and planet is ridiculous. Duncan, tell us about Jadora. Okay. When I was between jobs, uh, between my um, work in, at Clark and out here in California, I got called up by a former student of mine from Vanderbilt who was working for T-Mobile up in Seattle. And had, he had a good friend who has a business background and an environment background. And he uh, began uh, explained to us about this notion of a carbon market, that there are markets, both volunteer and compliance markets, that uh, pay uh, for people to preserve environmental services that absorb greenhouse gases. Mm. So you could get this, for example, in California, the Yurok Indians of Northern California, they had a big piece of reservation filled with forest, but they didn't want to turn it into condos they didn't want to cut it down and sell the wood, mm -hmm. but it wasn't providing them any uh, resources, mm -hmm. any income. So the state of California calculated how much those trees absorb in carbon and pay them annually out of the, out of the California carbon market mm -hmm. to not cut those trees down. That's beautiful. And it comes in every year because every year they've absorbed that much more carbon, yep. right? As a way of encouraging more trees or more anything on this planet yeah. that will absorb yes. the surplus carbon and other greenhouse gases that, as you know, we have way too much of in the atmosphere. The non-deforestation initiatives right. and the carbon <coughs> offsetting initiatives. Right. So this guy, a uh, very charismatic guy, um, also was lo uh, loves uh, what we might call uh, charismatic megafauna. He likes mm. big animals in Africa. Mm-hmm. And, uh, who doesn't? Yeah, like who doesn't? So, yeah. and was very upset about the reduction of their uh, ecosystems so that they're dying out, not just from being killed for food or for their trunks or whatever, but um, that their uh, environment is shrinking. And the last big place where the environment has not much shrunk, where the last really intact rainforest in the world, uh, and the second largest after the Amazon is the Congo River Basin. It's uh, about two thirds the size of the Amazon. Whoa. The Congo is the third largest river in the world. And uh, it's Whoa. only about 4% cut down. Wow. Now, so sadly, much for all the yeah. wrong reasons, it's not cut down, like bad development, no roads, 
abject poverty and 10 years of war. But uh, people have been distracted away from cutting it. Yes, down. cutting it yeah. down, and yeah. you know, basically lack of development that would have led to to, to the Amazon down. solution, yeah. whacking it for cattle and for soy and so on. Yeah. So uh, the only damage that's being done is local farmers cutting down, slash and burn, and planting very inefficient plants there. So we calculated that if we could get those farmers to stop cutting down rainforest for manioc and bananas and, and so on and get them to plant those things on already cut land mm -hmm. with improved seeds and improved uh, methods and then in the forested areas to plant coffee and chocolate mm -hmm. which are way 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 more valuable plants mm -hmm. we could get them to become wealthy while taking care of the rainforest mm -hmm they would be incentivized to keep the rainforest because they were making lots of money from it. Mm -hmm. And meanwhile, we could make money to run this program and to expand it through getting the carbon offset mm -hmm. costs out of the carbon market. So it's an educational piece, first and foremost, of humans. We think that we know what we're doing with deforestation yeah. or, or the way that we plant certain crops and and the way that we get yes. yields. But really, when we're educated by people that have already went through this process, they can tell us that we can plant certain crops in, uh, in other areas. We can, take, we can get financial incentives from non-deforestation. Yes. And that is really awesome. And that can be applied in so <coughs> many other places in the world. And of course, what we're really doing is sustainable community development. Yes. The very thing where, where my dissertation started in Highland Guatemala. Mm -hmm. And so I knew immediately we could not impose a system. We had to come and learn from them what would work. For example, we realized that fish are very popular um, along with unfortunately bushmeat, all sorts of wild animals. But fish could be sustainably grown in ponds. So we now have over 40 tilapia ponds, and they're able to eat a wild food, but domesticated, Domestic, yeah. which is a transition back into agriculture. Yeah. The reason why they're eating wild animals there is after the war, the only people that survived are the ones that ate wild animals. Now they need to transition back into a more sophisticated form of agriculture. So tilapia is one of the ways in. And the other way is caterpillars. Who knew these guys eat three months in the year, they eat caterpillars. And so we planted all the trees that grow these caterpillars all around the villages that were willing to be part of our conservation project. And now they get free protein a third of the year raining out of, their, of the trees that are around them. So they used to be in remote places in the rainforest and it put women and girls at risk to even to go out there. So we have learned from them the conditions of their lives. We use a profit motive based system so that they don't think that we're do-gooder charitable types are going to disappear tomorrow uh, and we enter in and make a deal you do this for us we'll do this for you mm -hmm. which they understand perfectly mm -hmm. and we'll employ quite a few of your yes, best yes. and brightest to work in our company to make sure it happens and oh those guys who are the best hunters we want them as our forest rangers yeah we want them to hunt the hunters and we'll pay them twice whatever they were making hunting yeah. to do so. So that project is going ongoing. It's a little bit on the shelf right now because we're having political difficulties in the country. Mm -hmm. But we're hoping in the long term that will work. And that's why I'm now putting some energy into this Mongolia one. Uh, to say it another way, you know, you might ask, why am I not continuing to work with the Mayan people? I've learned their languages. I've learned in depth about them. They're kind of doing okay. Certainly the, the mm -hmm. Zapatistas are doing yeah. just fine. But I'm in a point at this point with w the condition that the wor planet is in, that my feeling is I really need to put the last of my anthropological entities, mm -hmm. uh, energies into trying to save this planet. Yeah, the sustainable community yeah. development. Right, and, and non-governmental uh, approach has always been tiny, no scale. Mm -hmm. You know, we helped save the children, we helped nine municipalities. What about the other 2,000 municipalities? Mm -hmm. They're just going to resent us, mm -hmm. right? Whereas now in these projects, we're talking about large, large areas. Mm -hmm. Our target is 50 
seven million hectares. Yeah. That you can see from outer space totally, very clearly. Totally. In Mongolia, maybe twice that, maybe a hundred yeah. million hectares. Yeah. Right? That is a huge amount of land. We're not owning it. Totally. We're just renting the right to conserve it and yeah. get the, the uh, carbon offsets for it, which yeah. we cannot get unless we help the people do it right. Yes. Right? Exactly. So we don't get paid unless we do development right. Yes. And yes. if we are getting paid, we're also saving the planet. Yep. Do you follow yep. the yes. relationship? It's so, it's so beautiful. So it's a business model, ultimately. Me, the last person I ever thought, the shaman becomes the businessman, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But the business model, in essence, incentivizes the right behavior to scale. Yep. Yep. So it's the ultimate sustainable community development at a planetary scale. Yep. And that's where I've ended up, starting with little family in Highland Guatemala yeah. and an old shaman and an old midwife, and now I'm trying to save the, the, the planet These, as large chunks as I can get. It's the, <laughs> it's so beautiful because it's the sustainable community development. Those three yep. words are just, they're perfect. Sustainable community yep. development. The more that we can pass that down over time to children right. on earth, the better we'll be off. And I'm right. really happy that, that, you're, that you're, you're leading this in um, the Democratic Republic of Congo, and then from there, Mongolia, and then from there... Kazakhstan, Kazakhstan. maybe? Or There's so many places yeah. in the world where we can do this. Yep. I'm, I'm really happy that, yep. that, that you're working on that. And I've also trained up a bunch of students who are helping me with this. And when I go retire to my black, uh, blue elderberry farm in, in Northern California, they're all going to carry it forward. Exactly. So I don't have a feeling that it was, you know, my little one-shot deal and then it's done. And, and we have their generation and the following generation working on sustainable community development. Yes. Give us a quick bit on the elderberries. Okay. When I was still uh, fairly young and raising uh, little children, um, I, I ran into some health food hippie type of guy in Austin who said, if you don't want your kids bringing colds home from the daycare, try black elderberry. And so I, I went and bought them and made my own little syrup out of them and gave them to the kids. I never had colds anymore. And so uh, since that time, um, I have used it myself and have had very few. And I have spread the word to other people because it's not in the cold section of your drugstore. It's usually in the airplane travel section or whatever. Um, you know, Big Pharma does not want you to know there's a cure for the common cold. And uh, so my son moved up into uh, northern, northern central California in an area that is basically rednecks and pot growing hippies. And so I've decided that once I retire, I'm going to move up there as well and try to bring those two warring populations together around a replacement for pot because pot eventually isn't going to be worth very much. Now that it's legal and big corporations are going to grow vast quantities of it, the price is going to go down. But <clears throat> I have taught a lot of medical anthropology along the way and one of the things I know very well is A, it's all about the immune system uh, it, because uh, 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 people get diseases when their immune system is not up to par. Diseases that don't kill us, like I tested positive for TB almost every time I came back from Chiapas. But in a few months it was negative. Why? Because I have a really good immune system because I'm fed well and I have good exercise and I live healthy. But in the future as our pharmaceuticals are less effective against evolving bugs, it seems to me where we're going to need to put more of our emphasis is on a healthy immune system, not drugs that are going to kill a bug. And it turns out the Through best plants, kind of, huh? plants of the earth Yes, and who knew that the best elderberry is not the black elderberry of Europe, it's the blue elderberry that's native to California. Interesting. So I've already got 20 trees up there, three years old, and they're starting to produce, and the idea is to be a kind of Johnny Appleseed of uh, elderberry, which I predict in 10 years will be worth more by the pound than pot. Awesome, blue elderberries. Blue elderberries, and that will bring the rednecks and the hippies together because around health, 
and around revitalizing the rural countryside, replacing uh, trees that would burn in, in fires with blue elderberry, which is a bush and doesn't burn very well. You guys heard it here first from Duncan, the blue elderberry, yep. and get behind it. Get Go check it out and get behind it. Duncan, whoa, this has been super fun. Fun for me, too. Yeah. And I came back an extra day just to do this. <laughs> oh, it's so nice of you. Awesome. And there's just, there's too much to unpack about the sustainable community developments, yep. what you've learned throughout your time when you're explaining about how you can do a temporary segregation to empower women. Mm -hmm. that, that's so interesting. I, I see some of that happening today with our friend groups. There are these, um, these groups of women that are living together inside mm -hmm. of homes in Santa Cruz and the North Bay and the mm -hmm. Bay Area. And then they get super powerful and concentrated. Yes. And then there's no men there distracting them, yes. either, you know, sexually or whatever. Right, undermining and their authority. Exactly, and any of that. all yeah. that kind of stuff. Yep. So um, I'm actually, you know, this has been, there's so much good points that came from this. And I'm happy that you're running those four projects. They're very important projects for Earth. Because anthropology is not just about exotic places far away. Anthropology is about all of us on this planet. Yeah. You know, and yeah. it's a planet uh, we need to save, and we're not going to save it if we can't provide sustainable community development for the people who live on it. Yeah. And uh, lots of the people in the world have a way lower carbon footprint than we do, like the Mayan peasants that I lived with. Yeah. And way they're, all, you know, they're ready footprint. to save the earth. Why are they ready to save the earth? For them, the earth is a religious concern. The earth is it's, a it's living, a sacred, spiritual element. It's a sacred element. place. A so when you tra trash element. the earth, it's not just a bad intellectual idea or against the science of the environment. It's a sin. It is. And it is a sacred place. And we have to right. have be proper stewards of it. You know, I always say, if you believe in God, uh, what about God's creation? If God is sacred, why is God's creation not sacred? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep, right. that's a great way to put it. And <coughs> also, once we can get completely carbon-free forms of energy, um, potentially things like nuclear fusion at its absolute optimal, um, we can sustain on this planet forever very effectively and even uh, out into the cosmos. Wow. Such a pleasure. Thank you Pleasure's for coming all to mine. the show, Duncan. This has, been, this has been super fun. Everyone, go check out Duncan's links in the bio. Also, check out, check out AAA's links in the bio. Give us your comments on the episode. We'd love to hear your thoughts about everything that we talked about. Give us your thoughts. Go and build the future. Manifest your destiny into the world, everyone. Much love, and we'll see you soon. Peace. Bye, fellow Earthlings. See you, Earthlings. <laughs>